Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season we're a little bit different. How do you as a recruitment leader and founder maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm going to be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm going to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the RAG Podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by a guy called Matt Baird. Now, Matt is part of our sponsor, District 4's member network, but also operates under his own banner as Baird & Co. Another, uh, another installment of my recent startup series where I'm looking at getting the guys that are so fresh on the ground of recently starting organizations to give anyone sat there at home thinking, could I do this on my own? The inspiration, the knowledge, the reality of what it's like. So Matt started in February 2021, having been in recruitment, sorry, 2021, not 2001. I've been in recruitment for just under 10 years. He uh, worked for a number of agencies and in the pandemic decided it was time to go alone. Um, in that time, he's had some huge successes. He's had a lot of failures. He's made some mistakes. He's been isolated, but he's found a community. He's got, he, he, he's achieved and, and felt and, and been through a lot in that short period of time. So um, I'm super excited to get into this episode. I think anyone who's thinking about starting a recruitment company will benefit massively from this. Without further ado, Matt, welcome to the RAG podcast. Hi, Sean. Cheers for having me on. It's, uh, it's good to see you again. Absolute pleasure, mate. When did, how long ago did we meet? It was about three, four years ago, maybe? Yeah, about, about that. It was at one of the uh, TRN events, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then we spoke on Zoom and yeah. the world was a lot different back then, wasn't it? Yeah, like we, I remember we had like a Zoom chat and that was a rare thing. It's like, what do you mean? Well, that was when I online? just introduced it. So I think 2018, late 2018, we said, well, why are we jumping on trains all the time? Like, let's just fucking use Zoom. And people were, clients were a bit like, oh, really? But we were like, we're doing it. And, and then suddenly two years later, you tra training people in how to use it because yeah, no one else life, knew what was going whole on. Life, whole life revolves around this little box of a screen now, which, you know, uh, it works for me. I like it. But look, Matt. I've done you an introduction. I'd prefer it if you can give a better one. Uh, do For anyone who doesn't know you, just tell us who you are and what you do right now, like the overview of you and the business, etc. Yeah, so it's uh, it's Matt Baird. I've been in recruitment for 10 and a half years. Um, I set up on my own in February of 2021. Right. Um, I mean, there's 2020, very 2021 impressive. years, just get very confusing. But yeah, 2021 set up on my own, but in partnership with District 4. Um, I wanted to, wanted to set up on my own, um, but knew what I was good at and knew what I wasn't good at. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, spoke to district four, they provided all of the back office support. They got me a terms of business. They got me finances together. They got me all this great stuff. They partnered us within cherry and all the rest of it. Um, and just let me do the recruitment piece. But I kind of, when I started in recruitment, um, I fell into social housing. So there was just a team at, at Venn Group where I was at the time um, that they felt I'd be good at. They felt I'd be good at public sector. I didn't know really anything about the sector. Where are you, where are you from, Birmingham way? No, so I'm originally from Plymouth. Um, so I grew up there for 20 years and then I moved around a lot for about five years and then I'm now in Birmingham. Yeah, so... Where did I, you get I, into I, recruitment? Where were you based with Venn? Yeah, Birmingham. I was in the, I was in the central Birmingham one with Venn Group. And just fell in love with with social housing as a sector absolutely everything about its ethics its morals what it was trying to achieve um and then started training other offices and things like that but we'll, we'll come on to that in a bit but um when i was setting up on my own i knew i wanted to get back into purely social housing it was it's a sector i love um and i really like the people in it so 
Yeah, it's been about a year and three months now. And uh, Are you just you still, or have you built a team yet? Or just me? Um, just me. I it helps with District Four because if you need that admin support or you need some support here and there, then Sorry, they're there man. to support you with that kind of stuff. I think long term, I will set up a team. Um, I think that will be the the longer term aim to to probably build something around myself. But at the moment, it really works. I've got so much flexibility and so much. Uh, kind of freedom to recruit in the way that I want to and, and to go to a... Don't rush the team. Don't rush it. Like, everyone in recruitment is obsessed with headcount. Just fucking enjoy it for a bit. Like, see how you feel. I, and this like. is it. Like, I don't have... It's almost less responsibility, but in a weird way, more, because you're responsible yeah. purely to yourself, as you all know yourself. But it's mm. also... Yeah, I don't have to worry about checking in with someone else, making sure work's being done, getting paid on, doing pay, all that kind of jazz isn't there. It's, I do the work and, and also, I'm doing, I think, I think clients like it because then when they work with me, yeah. they know they're working with someone who knows what they're talking about. And I think that's one of the key things in recruitment sometimes. And, and you'll know this yourself, clients get really frustrated when you've got consultants you work with who don't understand the market. It's chicken um, and egg, isn't it? You need them to understand. You need you need to go through all the war stories to get there, but you you know your clients aren't patient enough for that. So it's tricky. I mean, <laughs> at the moment, I'm building out the sales team at Hoxo at the moment, and you know we've got four people. Yeah, so there's three in the team plus me and Amma. So there's a team of five of us, and we've always really done the you know jet revenue generation. It's a bit I love about the business. Um, but now it's like appraisal season and we've got like, right now we've got so many, you know, 30 people's appraisals to cover. And, you know, I'm like, I do love the team and I'm, I'm happy where we are, but there are moments where I think back to when we were really small and it's, it's just so much easier. Well, like I say, that's, you know, that's a week's work. Yeah. Course, it's, it's a, you know, 30 appraisals is a week. And, and, yeah. and it's not just that, it's the training that goes with it. It's the constant guidance and those kind of things. And sometimes you just want to do the bit you enjoy and, the bits I enjoy are doing the the roundtables and the media part of things that I do, and I enjoy doing the recruitment bit. And I'm yeah. like, actually, you know what? I don't need anything. Well, do you know else. what? My brother JQ was on the show a few weeks back. Well, he's yeah. a he's a mindset coach now, and he, you know what? I spoke to him this week about you know just update. He's in Costa Rica. He's living this mad life. <laughs> and, uh, he said to me, he said, look at all the different tasks you've got and measure how you feel when you're conducting them. And he said, and the ones that feel the best. Why not just do more of them and get other people to do the things that don't feel as good? And I was like, that's a because at the end of the day, well, something I realized was when I was, you know, and I've run teams and managed teams and the rest of it. I like mentoring. I like yeah. kind of bringing people through. I like kind of providing a bit of guidance. The day to day management, and I think people who I've managed will say the same. They said, "Look, you know what you're talking about. You're great at what you do, but you're not the best manager." And I know that, and that's a yeah. skill. And it's, it's because I don't enjoy it. I don't. Yeah. Uh, like you say, I don't get as much satisfaction out of have you hit your KPIs? Have you done this? Where are you with this? What's going on? Particularly when people haven't got the the kind of natural um, or, or when you may be being managed by people who do manage via targets. And so that's yeah. how you're told to manage. Yeah. yeah. Just it, it, It's just a self-fulfilling property of people being unhappy. <laughs> so it was, it was pointless. Well, look, and you know, what? I think it's really refreshing that you're you're on your own. You're happy on your own at the moment. Yeah, you might grow. But right now and what's life like outside of work? What have you? What's the situation? Yeah, I I met someone middle of lockdown, um, right. literally New Year's Eve 2020. Um, wow. So we we've been chatting online. She was she was up in Scotland, was moving down to the local area, and um, yeah, just got chatting. Thought, well, why don't we go on a date? Because everything was shut. Yeah, so yeah. we couldn't do anything. So we just went for went for a walk, and that's been that really. In a way, you've gone. Um, so that was really great. Um, at the time, I was living in a little flat by myself. Yeah, we've since moved into a bigger place where we now live together. So she moved great. in a few months ago, um, which was great. But it's because in that first six months, she couldn't speak to anyone else. So dating was Weird. it was really fun, but also really intense because yeah. <laughs> you literally had to rebubble. We bubbled as a yeah, like, yeah. Well, I did. I did the same. I got back. I actually re rekindled a relationship I had when I was twenty four with a girl who was who was in another city. So we did mm -hmm. the same. Yeah, she was Sheffield. I was Manchester, and we used to. We used to meet on a Wednesday night and then on a Saturday and weekend because the kids went to the dad. And uh, yeah, we did that for six months at the beginning of 2021. Um, yeah. And, and the first yeah, four months, sad. first three to four months was a bubble, wasn't it? Like you, that yeah. was it. I couldn't see anyone else. It was weird. Else. So it's, you know, it's really intense, but it kind of it also makes or breaks. So. She's really lucky, isn't she? They're both really lucky girls. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't she's for that bubble, I'm taking, I'm taking that. Who knows um, where they'd be if it wasn't for the bubble? Um, but, so you, 
so, that's so, that's so that side of things has been brilliant. I mean, in terms of the freedom, now I have my own business, like, it's brilliant. The, the amount of time that I can put into that relationship, the amount of time that I can put into going out and doing things with friends and not having to clear it with a boss about whether I can get annual leave or, oh, actually, I'm just going to go do this today. And I feel like, oh, I'm going to go and achieve with that is is amazing. Um, how, many years, how many years were you in recruitment then? So you started at Venn. Oh, uh, yeah, started in Venn in 2012. Right. Um, so, so I did nine months with Smile Education. Um, okay. So Katie Reese over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, didn't really work out for the party. Joined Venn Group. Was there five... Yeah, about five years. Then moved over. Question, to- did you question yourself after nine months and leaving a business, your first job? Did you think, is it? Oh working? yeah, it was. I mean, it, it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I've met Katie since, and we've had a really refreshing conversation. We we did it at the TRN event. Yeah. And I think culture fit. I think uh, sector fit. A lot of it just didn't. It just didn't work. Um. Yeah. And I. I mean, I've been doing sales, and I've been very good at sales before that. So I was like, I'll just go back into sales. And then Ven Group as well. Actually, it was a rec to rec. Kept yeah. going, oh, come and talk to us, come and talk to us, come and talk to us. I was like, oh, fine, yeah, okay, I'll give you, a, I'll have a chat. And they introduced me to Ven Group, who was so good on the training. I, and my career would not have got as good as, it, as, good as wow. it's been if it wasn't for the training of Ven Group. They were absolutely amazing mm-hmm. uh, and still are brilliant, uh, brilliant at bringing, you know, bringing people through. Um, and so, yeah, with their five years, wanted a new challenge want to be at the time was very much in that mindset of, i want to be properly running everything i want to be running something bigger and all the rest of it um but moved to a much smaller firm over in solly hole kate and co and managed their temps division and it was we did business support at the time along with social housing um and we broke records there and did everything else which was which was great and then yeah i think when lockdown hit i just kind of looked at journeys and where I wanted to be and what I want to be doing so so tried another firm for six months and thought now nah, I'm going to go off on my own um, so in the middle of the lockdown you joined a new firm yeah I, I left in summer 2020 um wow. so yeah first end of first lockdown so that when people um, were starting to hire again people were just starting to make yeah and it was, we had about three four months and I did you know I wasn't furloughed I mean I was furloughed right at the end when obviously yeah. handed my resignation which was fine but apart from that worked through it um and then yeah, moved over, like I said, moved to a firm for six months, but was finding the same kind of things of going, actually, the things I enjoy about the job, you know, the doing the round tables, networking properly, building longer term relationships without it just being about a quick win and a quick fix now and more focused on having less clients, but that are going to use me more regularly yeah, rather yeah. than having, and you'll know this, almost those targeted metrics of going, oh, it's great that, you know, these clients we've had for a few years and you're getting more money out of them than ever, but you're not bringing on enough new ones. I was like, but we're making more money and we're doing yeah. better than we've done before. And it is that kind of mindset. So the problem is, 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 is usually, I think I said this a few times, is when you're in a business for a period of time, if it's going well, you you, you kind of, you, you're on the same train journey, right? You're, you're both going down the track together and you see the same vision or you buy into the vision and then, I don't know what it is, but there's often a time where suddenly just some there's like a little derail, and then they're still looking at it this way, and you start looking at it that way, and then it, it's only a matter of time really before it, it's going to go off. And that's it. And you, yeah, and and there were a few, you know, and I, I will absolutely hold my hands up to my own mistakes with previous businesses, and kind of gone actually could have done that better, could have acted better there. Um, I think you, particularly when you're younger or when you're maybe a bit more. I don't want to say less corporate, but when you're just kind of going, oh, can we just get this done right? And you, yeah. you convince you see that, you know, you say the wrong thing to a manager or the wrong thing to the wrong person. And then as you say, those those little frictions just become yeah. just become more. And I've always been someone who's quite, I guess, headstrong and someone who's wanted to do more than just recruit. So, you know, like I say, when when I started doing the round tables and when I set up on my own, I've got a network of 12,000 people on LinkedIn. And I'm going, look, I, I can do more than just be. Oh, do you need do you need me to hire someone for you? It's it's what can I do with that network to actually make a difference? And I've always been a big kind of uh, big on kind of the social side and on the you know on our social responsibility. So yeah, there were differences of opinion on a number of things, including you know working in the office during lockdown and things like that with some businesses that I was just I don't really understand why. Bear in mind, yeah. it's just me on my team, but. You know, look, that's one of those. 
Set my you got to a point where you decided, you know what, other people's agenda and rules are just not for me anymore. Like that's it. Yeah, it's and and it's and and the way that things are done and the idea that no matter what you do, that's great. But what are you going to do next? You know, after a while, it just becomes that. Like, can we just can we just let the journey go and see where we're going? Because you've not done that before, and we're we're going great. So let's now not go right. Well, yeah, you know, I remember doing a budget and adding 15 20 percent or whatever it was for the year and going we're going to need 30 i was like well that's fine but at the beginning of the year we're going to be on this amount of money because my tents are going to finish yeah. well you can't be you need to be on here okay so you do that and then you start year here oh, mate, you i had, I had literally in the, in the i had an identical just, problem identical problem i had like three years of big fucking contractors coming to it. i'd like i don't know probably about 30 grand's worth of monthly revenue coming to an end in the first quarter of 2016, I think. And I was managing a team as well. So the business was doing, my little team was doing, I don't know, a third of the business revenue. And fucking all the legacy work I did before I went into leadership and management was still running. And so we had this big book, which was great, but it was coming to an end naturally. And nothing, yeah. So it was like, I've got, now I've got to manage all these people, hire people and, replace the book at the pace it's finishing plus do new deals to net growth i was like so we did three months of not growth we just stayed the same because we every deal we did we lost one and i got i got basically pulled into a room like this is the worst you've like what's going on what's wrong what what's wrong with you and oh mate i was fuming I was yeah, like, kind of going, this is bigger than when i took it over it's mm. bigger than it's ever you know we're still doing well we're still making plenty of money we've I'm more than covering my own overhead five times through, and your bonuses certainly aren't reflecting that. Yeah. And then when you you look at that kind of start of the year, and you kind of go and look, I know my candidates well enough to know that's finishing. You can have a go going. Well, you should have done more BD or whatever else. But what I've been doing is managing the growth of that book. My team is me and one other person. What what do you? And yet there was no BD from the higher ups. Yeah, you know, the directors didn't do BD. So you kind of end up going right. Well, that's one of those. Um, it, it was frustrating. I think it was frustrating all round, and you know, I think. But there was, but there was frustration on both sides. They were frustrated with me. I was frustrated with them. Um, and I, you know, I look at things in general and kind of go, actually, I've had, I've had a really good career. I've been mentored by some amazing people. Mm -hmm. Um, but the way I want to run, kind of run things now, is is different and can you I remember can you remember the moment when you made the decision like what you were doing where you were like when you were like right it's, fuck, it's gonna happen now i'm gonna go on my own yeah i it, it was it came through lockdown and it came through i wanted more freedom i wanted to be able to work at home if i needed to you know or if i wanted to if i wanted to be at home when my team was just me i wanted to be able to just go why am i traveling 20 miles a day or 30 miles a day to go to an office when I'm then just sat in a corner by myself anyway, working there. Um, and also I wanted, social housing is a really, really interesting sector because the people in it, when people are in it, they don't tend to leave it. They, they work their way through the sector in a number of different ways. And when you, when you get to that stage of really working with people who are, constantly supporting those who are most in need it does rub off on you you know you you want to be doing more than just as i said before you want to be doing more than just recruiting but yeah. when you do that you then get businesses coming to you going that you really understand the sector we want you working on x y and z you know i've recruited coos and you know other executive positions over the last year that i wasn't doing before i set up on my own and the reason for that is because i've built myself a reputation as someone who really understands the sector without it being muddled by everything else. And I think recruitment companies often, and some have really improved, um, were for a long time just talking about, oh, we've broken our best ever targets. We've done this, we've done that. Well, clients aren't bothered about how much money you're making as a company. They want to know what you're doing for them and their industries. Um, and it was, it was just this idea of going, why can't I, you know, could I do this on my own? And I didn't have the finances to do it. So I started reaching out to businesses which, I think there's a number of them out there which are like, oh, yeah, we'll give you X amount of money. You set up on your own. And then during year one, you need to build this. During year two, we need you to build this. And it felt just a bit like frying pan into the fire of going, Same I've as done well, that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I just, it's just done by myself doing it rather than anything else. And then District 4 came along. Um, yeah, and it was exactly what I was looking for. And 
and the support we've had from the team since has been amazing. But they are just a brilliant hybrid version of an agency, but by yourself, because there isn't a need to, you know, you run your business in the way you want to run your business and the support is there. And yes, obviously you have to build because you have to manage overheads and things like that, but it's not, it's not like you've got yeah, you've got to build because you've got to live. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, well, how does it work with the name then? So you're when you decided you're going to go in with James Johnson and the District Four guys, you you know you've got the D Four brand and then you've got Baird and Co. So how does that all work? Yeah, so you still set up your own limited company. You are still your own business. You are still you know I invoice uh, District Four invoice the clients and then I invoice District Four right um, because they're because District Four are the ones that provide you with the CRM with the finances with the HR team with all the rest of it yeah um and as, as well as having like you know I've, I've had a coach since I started um which has been one of the best possible things that could have been for me and my company is and, and Claire Mohammed has been my main coach throughout yeah. if you don't know Claire she's, she's no, brilliant yeah, yeah. but um yeah well, I've I've had a to begin with it's about twice a month now it's more once a month and it still right. is you know we're 14 15 months on and I'm still getting that monthly coaching, um, 16 months on. And, you know, that's been absolutely brilliant. But, yeah, so I set up my own business, set up my own limited company, and then it's, like you say, it's under that umbrella of District 4. So when I email, it's a District 4 email. When I, you know, mention things, it's 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 District 4. But I think the, the, the good thing about the distinction there is that, and, you know, it's a District 4 website with my profile on it. But the, the good thing is then when I'm speaking to clients about I'm a specialist in social housing and this is what I do, having Baird & Co as a almost separate entity, it's, it works for me. So when you speak to a client, you're Baird & Co. And then when it's an yeah. invoice, you're like, we're, I'm part of this. Yes. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just an invoicing contact. It's not a... And it is. And the, the benefits I get from District 4 aren't going to matter to my social housing clients. You know, that yeah. isn't going to matter to them too much. So they are interested in it. And it's just the website bit. If they expect Baird & Co and then they type it in and it ain't there. Yeah, yeah. So it goes, reads, yeah, you've got that and you've got, but equally my email address, so they go, well, what's District for? And so it's really useful because I can explain to them about the benefits of it, but that I am still my own business and that it is me and that it's me you're working with. I'm not going to go putting you off to, and, and you'll know what this is like, you know, like say you've run recruitment teams where, you build up a relationship with a new client and then someone somewhere will go, right, look, our, our new guy on the team needs to run at something. Can you pass that client across? And you just get that dread of going, yeah, but we're selling ourselves an expert here and this person's only been here two weeks. So you're then hand-holding and trying to kind of have that weird muddle thing of... You know why people do it and they have to. It's like chicken and egg. But if you choose that's not the route you're going down, then you'll win in a lot of, a lot of scenarios because... Mm. Clients will always choose the expert who's senior over the junior, right? So if you can, yeah, and they'll also want they'll want the person who's literally going to be able to find them the best person. And yeah. at the end of the day, that comes with experience. But as you say, you have to get the experience to do that. So it is a it's a catch twenty two. I'm interrupting this episode to bring a message from one of our sponsors, Vincere, who. Um, they're quite similar to Hoxo, I believe. What I love about Vincere is I think we've got very similar visions on the way we do things. And, you know, we do a lot of sharing about customer stories and successes. And I think they've they've tried to really share why you should pick them as a business through their customers rather than just talking for the sake of talking. So what I've been checking out recently, if you go on their YouTube channel, type V-I-N-C-E-R-E on YouTube and have a look at what they've been doing, you'll notice that they've been sharing stories from their community on a weekly basis. And it, what's amazing about this is that the customers have been raving about things like ease, ease of use, configurability, because look, we're not techies in recruitment for fuck's sake. There's a reason we are in recruitment. It's because we're probably not the most technical minded in many senses. But Vincere's tool actually is, you know, it's configurable for most people. Um, and they've got all these features now from you know, video interviewing, all these different areas that they're trying to bring in so that you don't really need to invest in other tech platforms. You can have a one-stop shop solution that will give you everything. Um, but don't just take Vincere's word for it. Watch their YouTube channel, find out what their customers think. I found it really interesting and uh, it's been awesome. So check out Vincere on YouTube um, and everything's on there. 
when you started off, obviously logistics taken care of. You got you got Ventura, you got coaching, you got it all up and running. What was it really like? You're still at home on your own, right? So what what did yeah. tell, talk us through day one in early 20, 2011? Yeah, um, 2021. Yeah, it was Sorry, 2001. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a long it time. Was, um, it was interesting actually. So there's a sign there just on my door. Uh, so my brother got that. I, was say, I can't read it. It just says Bed and Co Recruitment on it. Right. Um, so my brother that arrived day one, which was which nice. is cool because it just gave me a, an instant. Yeah, okay, we're doing this. Um, immediately it was straight onto LinkedIn. It was into you know, and the amount of support that I got straight off the bat on the, when I put out that first message, I'm setting up on my own and doing whatever else. The amount of backing I got immediately was brilliant. Did you have a issue, non-compete clause? Or? I was about to say the slight issue was a lot of people that are coming through going, I was going, can't work with you for six months. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll chat later kind of thing, but thanks for the support. But what it did do, social housing again is a very, they call it a very incestuous market. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone kind of has a link with, with someone else. So, as soon as people saw I was kind of going up and, and the amount of people going, we'll work with you, excellent, great to hear. Evidently, one or two other people came forward and I was like, oh, tell us about yourself. And so we got talking. And and I made my first deal in my first three weeks of the business, which happened to be the biggest deal I'd ever made in my whole recruitment career, which was absolutely brilliant. What was that worth? Uh, £17,000. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I was like going... And, and the way it works with District 4 is for the first 200 grand that you bill, you get 70%. And after that, you get 90%. Right. So suddenly I've got, you know, this is excellent. And money comes in and then another deal comes in because that new client needed someone else. And then it goes through and goes through and goes through. And you just, it, it just got some momentum, which is brilliant. The problem was, is suddenly in my bank account, I've got more money than I've ever had in terms of just off the bat. Yeah, and I took my foot off the gas. Yeah, because things have been coming in and 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 so naturally coming in and whatever else. I'm like, oh, this is easy. Why did I never do this before? This is simple. It's nice, yeah. And I probably had a couple of months where I didn't do BD, and I just filled the roles. And I was probably working twenty five hours a week. I was enjoying the new relationship. I was just flying high because Rob was getting better in. as well this time last year, right? Yeah, and that was it. And so I was I was laughing. And then evidently, as everyone knows in recruitment, if you don't do BD, then in two, three months, you'll notice it. And I noticed it and things dropped off. And I had... What was that around the summertime? Or? This was probably around October, uh, September, October. Right. So you I had can a couple see where, of months you can where, see where the summer hit you and then it's going to hit yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And then I had like two months where I didn't make any money. And suddenly I'm going, ha, huh, right, okay. Suddenly money is going out. It's going out on rent. It's going out on everything else. And I'm going... Right, what did it? Because I'd moved into this place before before Katie joined me, so I was just paying the rent. I was like, "It's fine. I earn enough. It'll be fine." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's where I think a little bit of the reality check here, which is that if you ever do, if I ever do take my foot off the gas, then it's me that's going to hit. There's no one else in the team to pick it up. There's no other team billing to make sure you still get commission. There's no there's no kind of existing relationships that might come from the you know the, the brand and whatever else that might come through um and so but what i was you know and I'd, I'd even stopped doing the round tables for a couple of months during the summer because I, the numbers were dropping because of summer holidays yeah and then i just got back on it and got myself a plan and again sorted this with claire and sat through and we really kind of analyzed what did, you, what, what, did you, what did your day plan look like when you made the changes yeah, so I mean, it's still up on my on my left hand side. Too, so I've still got a, a full wall chart here, which I created with Claire probably about a year, uh, about nine months ago. And so it's about okay. So when are you doing your roundtables? Because when you, they're giving you business, they're getting you business in, but they're also building your brand. So when yeah. are they going to be taking place? And when are they going to be building? Uh, so how are you then going to follow up on those? How is that? How is that process gonna gonna kind of build, and how are you gonna build yeah. that? So we put that in place. So it was right Tuesdays at eleven every week. Now with the roundtables, brilliant, sorted. Right Wednesday, get a video online. And I also worked with Lindsay Meredith for a while. Yeah, who was helping the business for a while, and she kind of helped a lot with the video side of things. Right, okay. So what day is your BD? What day is your LinkedIn BD? What day are the times you're going to be reaching out to existing clients? When are you really going to be targeting new? when are you going to be spending time to build that new list of who you want to be speaking with and who you want to be working with? Cause I work across England and Wales. Um, 
and it just and basically what you did is we just went back to basics and that's what recruitment is and you'll know this yourself recruitment is all about the basics and if you get the basics right and you know what you're talking about then then it works but you've just got to be consistent you've got to get those basics right and I think it's changed from the days of cold calling and from constant hammering the phone and that kind of jazz I, I haven't made a cold call in four or five months I've made yeah. plenty of phone calls but I don't cold call anymore you know I build relationships through LinkedIn or email or whatever it'll be and we set up a call and a conversation and and we that's basically way, what I tell everyone like that's just no, I don't I don't cold call future right yeah, yeah, you don't. This phone hammering malarkey is, is is ridiculous, and but we looked at other ways that we can build business. How do we use LinkedIn in different ways? What did I, and that's why District Four were brilliant because they came to me and said, "What do you need from us? What training do you need?" I was like, "Well, the issue is, and you'll know this yourself. You get to a certain stage, going, well, I don't know because I don't know what else is out there that I don't know how to do yet. Yeah, I don't know what I don't we, know. So I got training on doing LinkedIn lives. I got training on how to build other stuff. And it was, it was brilliant. It was really, really interesting. Um, and then, yeah, from there, it's it's developed a district four of co you know, I put some money in district four, put some money into uh, the community safety podcast, which is a specialist social housing podcast. So A, it was part of our CSR, but B, we want to get our brand up there. And there was no question from that from James. I said, look, I'm looking at doing this. He's like, okay, cool. In we go then. What are we doing? And it's those kind of things that are really, and we've sponsored um, domestic violence events and we've sponsored other things. And that so often just comes from realizing what the brand needs to do, or needs to be beyond simply, beyond simply a recruitment company, you know, beyond just, right, well, we're doing, this to make money it's like no let's do this because we want to affiliate our brand with what we say we are which is something different um we spoke about this before didn't we like the obviously my whole business is built around this right which is how do you effectively build a brand in recruitment how do you build a personal brand how do you build your agency brand that's all i care about talk about think about all day and <laughs> what i've learned Brilliant, like, Sean. <laughs> no, i mean obviously there is more to me than just that uh, uh I'd be in trouble if I said it. The one, <laughs> the, uh, but when it comes to my business, that's, that's basically the mission of what yeah. I'm trying to do, right? And it's funny because what recruiters need to survive is attention. So what you said before is you stop doing the basics and you, you feel it. Now, what happens is you stop getting attention. You said it before the call. You had a week off. There was nothing on your LinkedIn. You basically lost the attention of the, of the market because you're not there. And the, when you every time you phone someone, the intention is to get their attention. That's it. You want them, you want to tell them something. Like you mm -hmm. want to find something out. You need attention, right? So the whole thing around marketing is about gaining wider attention. Now, is the attention from a roundtable or a you know podcast or a video or whatever going to be the exact same level and detail intensity as a phone call? No it's not like people need to understand that it's not you don't put a video up and get 50 phone calls coming in like it doesn't work that way but <laughs> what great. happens is what happens is over time and you know you do your round tables you do your podcasts you do your lives you do your you know you do your content on linkedin what happens is the people that interact reveal themselves so it's really easy to see who's liked your shit it's really easy to know who's signed up to your event it's really easy to see who turned up to your event like you people who buy into something that you're prepared to give reveal themselves and as a result they warm up the introduction so the outbound becomes about how do i get people into the ecosystem and then i go and work that room as hard as i can and obviously i know from experience that over time it then does become inbound people will genuinely come to you and i get messages daily going sean can we talk about your your, your, your academy or whatever because I'm, I'm still doing the the outbound bit like that's that's that is literally ingrained in my day, but and my team's day. But the inbound comes later. Was what most recruitment companies think is right. So we're going to pay a bit of money. We're going to put some content out, and instantly every client in the market is going to be like, "We want to fucking here's a job." Every candidate's going to go, "I want to work with you." And it's just, man, still, you know, I do get, I, I get a nice blend of inbound, uh, of inbound work. But as you say, if I didn't do the outbound with it, then I'd be getting nowhere. Yeah, but I know that actually my inbound, sorry, my my marketing side of things. It's almost just to reinforce my outbound calls. Exactly. So kind of saying, look, I'm not someone who's just saying I'm doing X, Y, Z. The reason I've got, you know, 
you want it, you want an expert, you want someone who's talking about it. Okay, well, go and have a look at any of the 30 recordings of the round tables I've yeah. run where I'm not just facilitating a conversation, I'm actively engaged in it and putting questions out there to ask what we need to do as an industry to fix this. And I've I'm actually I'd say 70, 80 percent of the way, along the way of becoming a board member at a housing association, which has been wow. a goal of mine for a long, long, long time. But that's come about from the roundtables, the branding, the marketing, but also then being able to turn around to someone and not just have those conversations about, oh yeah, look, I, I recruit and I do X, Y, Z. It's, I can ask questions about the market because I'm doing the outbound, so because I'm doing the marketing work and I'm doing those roundtables, I'm learning all the time. And yeah. people are talking about stuff. And you'll know this. You'll have learned more from, you know, what's going on in the market and what's going on elsewhere from your marketing and from people talking to you about your marketing stuff than you ever could from a phone call because yeah. you know more questions to ask. You know questions to ask that didn't even exist before. Yeah. I think this is the – I think this is, you say, is where and a lot And you talk of, a lot wider than what you do for a living. So most recruiters will ring up and they'll just talk about a vacancy and their experience and they stay in this box. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. but when you then enter, leave the box and start talking more industry-wide, again, you're never going to beat the industry in the knowledge of the industry. You've got to remain true to the fact that mm -hmm. you are a recruiter. But be, and, and being confident enough to say that to a client, say, yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Can you help? Because yeah. they will. Unless, and if they don't, because if, if there's like a, an arrogance there that doesn't want to, then you probably don't want to be working with them. But in 2012, the Welfare Reform Act came in in social housing. I remember learning about it, learning about it. And within a year or two of being at then, I was training every new person who joined the Birmingham office, A, on what housing was, but B, on the Welfare Reform Act, because there were new teams being set up. There were new parts of social housing being set up, dealing with under occupancy tax and bedroom tax and other stuff, that no one was talking, you know, it was, it was big in the social housing media. There was a little bit on the national media. But if you talk to your client about that and about this was just as universal credit was coming in compared to job seekers allowance, which you used to get, you really, the, the conversations were so, so much, you know, were elevated to such an extent because people knew them and actually you knew what you were talking about. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it is, learning some keywords and key phrases, and then you will keep learning. But just getting that, that initial bit of conversation running is, is huge. I agree. Well, um, so... When it comes to the, biz, the the industry you recruit, what type of roles do you actually? Because there must be so much going on in social housing. What level and type? It, it is, and this is and this is one of the other guest sides of the business that I'm I'm working with at the moment. So I'm doing some work with Sandwell College, because like a lot of industries, there needs to be a huge focus on getting like that next wave of people through. And I think unless you've got a massive brand, i.e. JLR, Coca-Cola, whatever it will be, then or Google, then you know, people stumble into whatever you do. Yeah. Now, social housing is so vast in its careers. It's, it's insane. Like you can do anything you want because they've got, you've got your marketing, you've got your IT, you've got your finance, you've got your HR, you've got your media, but you've also got housing development. You've got people going over and building stuff. Yeah, and so yeah. every role in the sun under that, but you've also got people dealing with antisocial behavior and working with the police and, and everything to do with that. Um, I tend to work on roles from kind of housing officer, which is, I'd say, 25 to 30K, um, up to, I mean, the, the most senior role I worked on was 110,000, which was for a specialist business development director. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then other places I've recruited a COO at a lower salary. So right up to executive teams. Um, and I've recruited for boards and I've recruited for, you know. So would you go into a housing association and say, I'll cover any area? Or do you say, I'll only, you know, give me. No, I, I'm probably, I am definitely stronger on housing kind of splits into two areas. You've got, I'd say, your, your housing management, which is your people who go out and look after people. And then you've got your development side, which is your trade operatives right through to your, you know, development directors. I'm strong on the housing management. That's where most yeah. of my uh, skill set comes from. Um, I don't tend to do much in the customer service side unless it's going to be a mass project. Like if yeah. it's going to be, because, and you'll know this yourself, the cost of recruiting is is expensive now. You know, I mean, just I, I did a, I did a project with Claire where we worked out that like just to recruit someone was about seventeen hundred to two thousand pound just to do a basic kind of piece of recruitment by the time you've done advertising and everything else and, and all the work and the hours that go into it. 
And so if you're doing customer service, you're not really making any money on it. And I've got to keep the business running. So, but if someone turns around and says, oh, well, we're going to need five people in customer service. Well, I know that based on volume, I can make that work. So, and they're all the same people anyway. So you can. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, that if you're going to advertise or whatever it will be, that one advert will get you a shortlist or will get you some people or, you know, your own set. You know, when, you, when you're then hammering through the calls, it's, I know it sounds awful, but there's less vetting. You know, you yeah. don't need to dive into quite as deep about every single area. It's like, right, well, I use strong customer service. Do you understand the sector? Yada, yada. Are you yeah. actually competent at communication? Um, which <laughs> unfortunately isn't always the case. Um, but it is very much a, I, I tend to work kind of, I don't really do anything under 25K. I don't feel that actually I need to very often. I think most housing associations now are becoming very, very good at the entry level positions themselves and the, you know, those positions which are going to be, you know, the the, the next next future. And that's why I'm doing this work with Samwell College, because actually if we can get apprentices in, it's another area that there's a, housing needs to become more diverse and it, it desperately needs more diversity in it. And you do that by engaging young people who are from a huge range of backgrounds. So again, it's just another area that I'm working with people on. And as I say, it I find that interesting. I find it engaging. Do I make money out of it? No, not yet. Is it something though that if I'm going to have a conversation about that for an hour and a half a day, it's going to lift my own energy and then I'm going to be better later in the day. And I think it's, it's also a topic like that. that I think a lot of your clients are going to be interested in as well. They know, oh, they they know it's a problem. What, what I want to get into is more around like what's it genuinely like mentally on a day to day now? Because you've already been very open that you know you, you you did take the foot off the gas, and you saw you felt the pain. Yeah, I, I don't. I've been a business owner for five years, and I don't think it's a linear line. Like I think you go through these periods where it's mm -hmm. difficult, and you find it easy, and then it's difficult, and it's kind of like it's, it's like the stock market. It just peaks and crosses. <laughs> um, you know, like this year, I look at. At the half year point, we're exactly where we wanted to be, but the first three months were stronger than the than the next three months. So I'm like, we're in decline. So it feels it feels more negative than than it than yeah. you know. I, I predicted yeah, I exactly where we're going to be, and we're literally to the penny, pretty much there. And I'm like, wow. And, and everything's so I, I should be sat here going, but it feels like it's moving because we yeah. started so fucking well. But if I look at my day, I can empathize and go, do you know what? I think there's things I've stopped doing. There's things I was doing that I'm not doing, and there's there's always and then I'm trying to find the energy to constantly do it when I and this is this is the one thing I'd say from working on my own. You feed off a sales environment. You naturally yeah. feel off, and if you're in an office and you're with people, you you feed off that energy. If I don't bring that energy through that door, it's not there. And there will be days that I'll sit here and I'll have Spotify on my on my thing in the corner, and I'll be listening to whatever, and I'm like, come on. And I'll be doing something. I'm like, right, in five minutes, you're starting. Do what you need to for the next five minutes. Play on your phone. Check out social media. Do whatever you're doing. And then you've got to get started with this. Yeah. And that is difficult. And it is. And, but there'll be other days I'll come in and I'll get in here at half seven in the morning. And suddenly it'll be six o'clock. And Kate's going to me. She's like, are you, am I see, are you coming down this evening? What's your plan? Yeah. Um, but I guess also on the, on the flip side of that, that's where it works so well for me because – I mean, I've got ADHD anyway, and for me, one of the big things is I'll get I'll get areas of like hyper focus. So suddenly I'll come in and I'll do, and and I've, and I've known this from working in agencies. I can get done in two hours. What other people it will take four or five because I'll just go 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 and get it done. When I do that, I'm like, right, I need to now stop for half an hour, and mm -hmm. I've got the flexibility to do that because I haven't got a manager going, Matt, what are you doing, or yeah. whatever else, and you kind of. And we've all been you still feel a bit guilty regardless of and you're just staring at your screen and you've done nothing for an hour but you're you're present in the office so people are happy with what you're doing yeah yeah but do you ever feel guilty though because of the way you were trained yeah. i do i i still five years later because i was trained to always beat your desk yeah when i'm not I, even though i can justify it and i can yeah. say it's my business i still feel guilt a hundred percent and you kind of go in i should be doing i should be oh. doing this right now I should be and, yeah but i don't need to it's okay i've got You've got time. Yeah, but I should be. And it's, and yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And mm. it's, you still almost feel the need to justify every hour of your day and kind of going, if I'm going to be doing that, is that actually worth my use of my time? So what I've doing... learned recently is that actually, as long as things are catered for, mm. it's when things have not been done. Like when you said you were going to do something that didn't happen, that's when mm. you feel it. Whereas if you can go, well, 
it's in the diary for later so I can afford this half an hour in the sun or walking the dog or whatever the fuck you're doing. Like it's then it's okay because you've got freedom within the structure, but it's when you break the structure and you go, well, I've just fucked, sacked that off. I didn't hit that number. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. That's when it My clients like, always know that if they come to me with a position, I mean, my, my hit rate last year was uh, 80, no, don't lie, 92%. We worked out. So there were a couple of roles that didn't fill. The rest all filled. Mm. I'm delighted with that number. That's brilliant. That's great, yeah. And yeah, so my clients know, and, and the roles that didn't fill were one of those ones where I was like, they've had five agencies on it and no one's finding a bugger. So that's, I, I don't, you know, I don't mind not filling all of them. Um, but anything where I turn around and said, look, I know I can fill this. And that's the other side. I think when you get on your own and whatever else, you have to be very careful with what you can promise. You have to say, look, yeah, absolutely. I can fill that. Or look, this is going to be tough. This is what I can do. And this is what I can't. Um, but anyway, when I was, when you when you're trying to kind of justify your own time and the rest of it you have to i i couldn't agree more with what you said there you have to have that kind of list of this yeah. must be done yeah. i don't care what mood you're in i don't care how you're feeling i don't care if you've been out the night before i don't care if you're on a week that must be done and if you just get that done at least you're on the, you know you'll know that in a couple of months yeah. you're going to be okay and that's going to come through because of xyz because you know how your market works but it is it is difficult. It's it's great because I can work my own hours. And if I'm going to finish at three, I'm going to finish at three. If I feel actually I've had a really productive day and I'm done, I'm done. If I'm going to start at seven, if some days I'm going to start at 10 and work through till whatever. Is know, you more, are you normally an early, early starter? Yeah, um, I'm up and I'm up and away. But then there'll be times, as I say, so I'm going to uh, Ramstein on Sunday with my mate. Um, been wait, Three years been waiting to watch this gig. We bought tickets three years ago. Lockdowns cancelled them and all the rest of it. No, I know Sunday we're going to be finishing. Actually, I know who you're talking about, by the way. <laughs> They're a German metal band. It's... Oh, yeah, no idea. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. They sold out the Rico Arena in less than an hour. They are a massive German metal band, but they are a German yeah, I d- I'll be honest. I probably look a bit German with my specs on. But <laughs> let me tell I don't know what German metal even is, so it's not my fault. Yeah, look, absolutely yeah. fair. Uh, yeah. Go on. I, anyway, it's one of those. Um, so that's Sunday, and then what? Is it going to be Sunday, a heavy but I know that we're going to be finishing. We're going to be over in Coventry at about 11 p.m. Then got to get back and all the rest of it. I'm not going to be up at 9 a.m. to work. I'm not going to be, if I was back in an agency, I'd probably need to be back in an office at quarter past eight, half past eight. And mm-hmm. I know that if I did that, I'm going to be incredibly unproductive. Yeah. I'll sleep in, I'll have a really good day, and then on Tuesday I'm going up to Manchester for the National Housing Conference. Um, I appreciate this is coming out just after it, but we've got, we've got that, and... I'm doing my first ever live round table. So we've got 35 people coming along, all heads of and directors of housing coming together. And I'm running that networking event. Now I've not done that before. I've done it online for the last two years. And so I know what I'm doing just about, but A, it's going to be a challenge, but B, it's an opportunity. I've, I've self kind of either self-funded or I've got sponsorship for that I'd never have done before setting up on my own business. And they're probably you know, the amount of time that I've spent on the round tables and the rest may not have been, it may, would have probably been difficult to justify if I was still at an agency. And yet now I've got this event running and it's, it's, it's a phenomenal opportunity. Our second sponsor is always District 4. Um, District 4 have worked with me, um, or been a partner to this show for a long time. And they are designing, designing a business that effectively wants to give recruiters their time back and also allow them to start a business. So do you want to have more time? Do you want to build more money? Do you want to spend more time with family? Do you want longer weekends? Well, all of D4's members have found that. You know, they don't have meetings and commuting and all the unnecessary shite that a lot of recruitment businesses put their teams through, especially when they start and they think they have to keep all of the structure that they've had before. Sometimes for people like you and some, I mean, I'm a bit like that. I like to wake up and just know I can control my destiny on a given day. And District 4 allows you to do that. So if you're somebody who wants to start a recruitment business or has already started and is struggling to scale um, in the way that you want to, not the traditional way, then get in touch via www.districtfour.io forward slash Hoxo. Check out what they can do. This is what I mean by your working day is, is what you need it to be, but... I think you need those moments, as you as you mentioned there, where things are more difficult. Where you have those periods of decline because it makes it gives you that little bit of reality check. Going, yeah, things are never going to be great consistently. And I mean, unless you're going to own Amazon or something, then 
your money isn't going to come in every single week, every single day, every single month. You're going to have times of actually, you know what, we need to try something different here because this isn't working. And yet often as, as we kind of circle all the way back through is you've just got to get back to your basics. But what if, are the basics? Do you agree that in those instances it does affect your confidence and your ego oh. and it makes you think like it's my fault, I'm not good enough? Like, Do you still go through that in your head? Yeah, definitely. I think you still get that imposter syndrome. You definitely still get that moment of have I made the right call? Um, there was definitely times back end of last year where, you know, if I was going to go back into the agency world, there's, there's an agency I know that I'd reach out to, um, that I've spoken with since, um, not in terms of joining them, but they reached out and said, oh, we know you've left it wherever, you know, would you consider coming and speaking to us? And I was like, I'll set up on my own, but if ever it doesn't work or if ever I feel a need to go back into an agency world, then they'd be who I'd speak to. And yeah. it's, it's difficult because, as I said earlier, one of the key things as well in recruitment is that it's the social element. It's a massive part of massive part of the game. And you don't, I, well, I'm lucky with district four because there's still other guys in district four that I can speak to every week. They can speak yeah. to every day that I can reach out to, we can build relationships with. If I didn't have that, it'd be very, it'd be very lonely. It'd be very difficult. And I think that's probably one of the other reasons why people may build teams even faster than they maybe need to, because it's just company. Yeah, um, but Jez Heard, who I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, he said the same thing. He was like, he he just fucking he just needed people around him. Like he's like he's lonely. I had I had some brilliant time working down at a co-working space in Mosley near me. They're really good, yeah. don't get me wrong, but nearly everyone there it was almost a pure on your laptop role. Oh and mate, so, yeah, and I was don't, on the phone. Don't and get was, me on I'm that. going back to those days. They hate you as well. You were the only you. one on the phone in an office. and But it was like that all the time. And I was like, no, it can't. But they, you know, everyone else is like, oh, it's okay. I'm like, no, don't like this. Don't like oh, this. No, I, I've been told off in every co-working spot I've ever been in for talking to. Yesterday, I, my next door neighbor knocked on my door and said, can you be quiet? Because I was working in the garden. I was like, it's my fucking garden. He's like, <laughs> like, yeah, but I can't concentrate. I'm doing a written piece. I'm like, well, put your headphones in or something. Like, yeah, yeah, like, do, yeah, you can you can't win. Like in a sales job, you can't win. But then I couldn't imagine going back to an office with everyone talking and trying to have a decent conversation. I don't know how we used to do that with one ear. It was madness. Yeah, it was. And let's say, I mean, I guess I was, uh, you, you just learn to tune it out, don't you? But I think as well, when I when I was working in offices and when I was doing well in those offices, half the time, my ear was always listening out to my team or other people in the company or wherever else, just see if I can help out elsewhere because I was yeah. one of the more senior people or whatever it will be. and Or I knew something and I knew I could help. So therefore yeah. you are half concentrating and then you've got oh why haven't you done 20 more candidate calls to find out a lead i was like oh, because i'm doing other stuff that's working and yet it's it's those constant you know and, and one of the places i worked was one of your targets was on phone time how long were you on the phone each day how long are you on the phone every week and you just start kind of going you're dragging out calls you yeah. are calling businesses that you know you are yeah, you're driving yeah, the wrong yeah, yeah, be, Basically, I would be like, I would call you and we'd yeah. have a chat for 25 minutes. That'd be 25 minutes of my call time. Would it give me any value? Probably not. No, would I have got more value from my business by doing half an hour on LinkedIn, an hour on LinkedIn, doing outreach? A hundred percent. Yeah. It's just, it's yeah, not, but Matt, you haven't logged all that on the system. I was like, that's because I don't want to spend all day doing logging stuff on the system. Just trust me that I will make you money. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing yeah. I can hold my head up and say I've done everywhere I've been. So that comes, bringing that back then to your current lifestyle, a couple of things I want to ask about. So like, what's your biggest fear right now? Deep question, but what are you worried about? I think I'm still worried it won't work. I think I'm still worried that it'll get to a stage of the clients I'm working with will suddenly go, we're not going to, you know, we've, we've signed a PSL and you're not on it or... Uh, even though there's no reason to think that at all. No. I think it's still a bit that imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm worried about... Uh, um, a recession, evidently. I think everyone in recruitment is a bit, but I work in the public sector yeah, and I work in social housing. And the one thing with that is that they didn't, they recruited during lockdowns. They recruited, yeah. they didn't stop. They didn't go on to furlough. A few of the trades teams, um, sorry, a few of the frontline customer service teams might have, but by and large, everyone worked through it. Everyone continued to work through it. It actually created a bit of animosity sometimes with the private yeah, sector yeah. because no one got that time off. Um, and obviously now the public sector are the ones that are trying to get a pay rise that they feel they've deserved and not getting it. Um, and 
Yeah, I guess it's, it's a really interesting one in terms of biggest fear because you never want to kind of be called out for, you know, one of the things I'm is within social housing is I'm authentic. Like I know the sector, I care about the sector yeah. and you don't want someone turning around and going, oh, well, you're only in it to make the money. And that kind of spiraling, I'm going, I'm, I'm really not like, yeah. yes, I make money out of this. Yes, it's a business. Yes, it's a company, but I'm really trying to kind of add value and give back here. Everyone losing kind of, that kind of everyone. credibility within the sector and losing that, you know, I, 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 I probably see my career transitioning over time in terms of constantly you know, always having that recruitment piece there, but doing other stuff as well. But in the long run, I, you know, I'd love to consult more with the social housing sector myself as a, as a, as an actual candidate. And, you know, I mean, I've worked with boards to talk about their succession planning and what they're missing out and looking at it from a, from an outsider's perspective. And as I say, trying to get a role with the board myself at the minute. And I think it's one of those where that's a fear. I think also, like, there's a fear of falling out of love with it. And mm. there's a fear of kind of going, actually, I'm exhausted with this, which is fine. I'm one of those. What the hell would I do then? Like, <laughs> I think there's a thing that a lot of people in recruitment end up getting into is, what else do I do? Like, because it is a very, it's quite niche in terms of what it does. And it does lend itself to a lot of other sectors, but, and people go internal and then go and do other things, but it is quite niche. And so that's why I'm constantly making sure I've got that outlay of other areas, because if it ever does, the recruitment industry does collapse and AI takes over and all the rest of it. Yeah. That's the, I guess, yeah, in 40 years time, AI might be doing all recruitment. So if I'm doing that, I need to have other skills because that's some good people. I don't think you, yeah. If you're still doing the exact same thing in that room in 40 years, I think you failed. <laughs> you failed then. <laughs> you need a bit more. You need a bit more. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you there. If I'm yeah. still living in a, yeah, a little rental house in, in, 40, yeah. in 40 years time, something's probably got a bit awry, but yeah. You know, so what is the vision then? If you're going to paint the, 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 the ideal scenario like if things go to plan and I, I don't care if you've not thought about your five-year plan just whatever do you see in the future yeah, so, so long as, term as what excites yeah, you? it would be always be an executive recruiter keep that going because i just i love that sector i love the area of it i love the particularly in senior management because you're it's so that there's such a focus instead on just kind of going right well we need to get someone in and they need to be the, you know it's real down to personality and culture fit and all the rest of it and i love i love that whole piece um and i'm working with the business at the moment that you know i'm trying to help them think outside the box as well a little bit on a few candidates and we're working together on that which is which has been really really great and i love that um but yeah i guess it would be working more directly with a housing provider and, and going in and having a role where i'm really consulting with them on their on their branding. I think it's the one thing that South Housing Association's really, some are brilliant at it, but not very many. Mm. And there's definitely a piece there around working with them. And it required more training for myself. You know, I'd have to get more, you know, I'd probably end up speaking to you guys about, you know, getting training on whatever else, but working businesses to go in and go, look, look at your businesses, LinkedIn, look at your, what you're actually trying to deliver. You're trying to recruit, you're trying to really engage with your audience. Um, and you're trying to engage with your tenants better. And yet, this is what your branding is saying about you right now. So yeah. this is what needs to change. And this is how I can help you do it. And particularly with tenants. Because the only thing you hear about in, in social housing on the news is when, oh, these flats are in an awful condition, or these people are living in damp, or these people have been yeah, evicted. Yeah, yeah. There are millions of people living in social housing in the UK. And 95% of it is amazing. Some of the stock is absolutely incredible. And yet... Isn't there a rule now that like even all these new builder states, there's a small percentage needs to go to social housing? Yeah, so it's been in place for years. The section 20 yeah. has been in place yeah. for years and years, and yet you don't hear about it. And actually, you see some of the stock that's going up, you're going, Well, anyone would live there. Yeah. And you have stuff like shared ownership. I've had I've had friends who bought shared ownership. So the housing association will own part, you'll own part, and you'll slowly buy more and more of it off until you sell it. And it's a way for people to get into the housing ladder. And the customer service and the care in, in most housing associations are, it is genuinely brilliant. And I love the people in it, but it's a sector that I think the media taints. And so if I could get involved somehow in changing that narrative and being someone who was on, I don't know, TV or in the media or whatever, I was talking actually about the successes of social housing, what it does deliver and why people need to look at it as a career in order to engage more young people who are living in social housing at the moment 
who are maybe getting bullied for it, who may be getting ostracized for it and actually helping them go, look, well, why don't you come and speak to the housing association and get a career out of this and build your way up and through. Right. And then we can change that whole narrative around living in poverty and living in, living in poor, in poor accommodation, because there are unfortunately still rogue landlords. There are so many people that are living in really poor, poor quality stock. And yet things can be done to change it. You know, I, I was on an amazing round table yesterday talking about homelessness and how actually we can just eliminate homelessness. We just need to do, you know, there's a few things that need changing. And one of those is working with people on their mental health. So it just goes and goes and goes as a sector. And it's, if I can consult with people to really make sure they're getting the best people in, in that senior management teams, because I've already, most of the people I then speak with the heads of, they're all looking for that next executive position. Yeah. So I know that network. I know these people who are desperate for that next step up. And I've identified the ones who I'm certain would be brilliant at it. If I can amalgamate that with consulting with housing providers to to realise that they can be more and to realise that, that that narrative around the media can change and that narrative around uh, their own branding can change, then then that'd be amazing. But it's it's a long way off and it's finding the right people to kind of coach and mentor me to get there. And I think that's the other side of things is, and that's why exciting. I love having a coach. It's exciting. I mean, you've, you've got... People you're going to need above you, and you'll you'll need to build people around you because <laughs> you can't keep doing it all. But no. for now, it sounds like you know you're in you're in the thick of year two. It's going well. You you clearly you know have energy and 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 drive. And um, I think I think I really appreciate the vulnerability and the honesty around what could go wrong because I think we all have that. I have that every day. Like you, you know, we all the nature of a role where you sell for a living is that, you know, it can all fall apart. You know, you're not paid a massive basic salary within a massive corporate. You are everything you, you, you know, you eat what you kill or whatever people say, but that, that doesn't, there's, there's, there's unfortunately not a long-term obvious clear, you know, if I just sit on this, it'll, it doesn't, it, you've got to keep, keep working it. So and you'll know this yourself when you set up on your own, there's no salary. No, like it's, if you're not, if you're not making money, if you're not, if you're not, you know, if you're not actually selling anything, you sat there without an income coming in. And it is, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, and yeah, I'm so glad I did it. It's, it's something that a lot of people turn around and go, oh, really proud of you for doing it. Really proud of you for giving it a shot, et cetera, et cetera. And that's great. But I've always probably just been a bit compulsive and gone, sod it, I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of people who who think it through for years and don't do it. And that's what this show's designed to help people who are already growing growing agencies. But I'm really, I'm really passionate about that startup community, like you guys, you were two years ago. I want people who are thinking, oh, could I do it, to listen to stories like yours and go, yeah, I can. Of course I that's can. That's the thing. People talk as well about your restrictions and you talk about your six months of you know non-competes and the rest of it. When you set up on your own, you go national or you go international, you go whatever you need to. And most people who are setting up on their own have a network. Hmm. So they ask that network, look, I can't work with you for six months, but who can you recommend that I could? Yeah. And a network grows. And suddenly then your own network grows. And you become reliant on those relationships that you've been sure have been there for years. Um and I remember actually, it's quite funny, a, a client turned around, sorry, an old business turned around to me. I was under non-compete. And I was really good friends with the director of housing, really good friends, uh, know his kids. We regularly quiz together. We go for drinks together. And I got a letter through from them, legal letter. We're taking you to court because you've broken your non-compete. So I got him to email them. And he just said, Matt's informed me I can't work with him until X date. Uh However, I'm still going to quiz with him. I'm sure that's not a problem. And we just never heard anything again. Wow. And it's that kind of thing of going, actually, you know, you've allowed your relationships. You just have to make them aware that you can't work with them during this period of time. You can't solicit them. You can't talk about business. Yeah. You can't sell to them. But you can certainly still have a relationship with them in terms of going, yeah, things are going well. Looking forward to yeah. you know, seeing if we can work together an X amount of time. Because you can't stop people talking to each other. No. And you can't stop people who've got long-term relationships from having relationships with each other. Um, and those people will help you because as you said there, whenever anyone sets up on their own, there is that, all right, well, we want to see that person succeed. We want to see that person do well. What can we do to help? And and people want to help. 
Yeah. At least that's what I found. No, I agree. And I think that's a great point. Um, Matt, thank you so much for today. It's been really, really, really a pleasure. I love, I love the startup stories. I think you're right in the thick of the early days. You know, you've got that natural energy. You've had ups and downs already, but you know, I wish you the best of luck. And I think you're, I think you're going to smash it. If anyone does want to, if anyone does want to talk to you, if anyone sat there thinking, look, that sounds like something I'd be interested in finding out about District Four and how, and just your story in general, is LinkedIn a good place just to drop you a note? Yeah, definitely. LinkedIn's always great. Um, I mean, all my contact details, my email and my number are on there anyway. Um, but certainly, you know, for me, District 4 was was the right way to go uh, and continues to be because um, we've talked a bit today about kind of the isolation and sometimes you get stuck on your own. But knowing I'm not, knowing that actually if I'm having one of those days, weeks, months, you know, reaching out to the other guys and going, look, anyone got just some time to chat or... Um, anyone fancy a beer, even if it's virtual or look, I've got this idea. I'm trying to run this. Has anyone got some time to talk it through? It's always a yes. It's always, yeah, a, yeah right. Cool. Let's have a chat. Let's see what we can do. And one of the guys had managed to inadvertently book a, a meeting with the board of a housing provider before and gone, mm. would you come with? I was like, yeah, of course I would. I'll come along. Um, and, and it was great because you collaborate and you work together on this kind of stuff. So it's, it's really important um and there's just a lot of mutual respect there and i think that's the thing that sometimes is, is one of the most fun things you know, also one of the difficult things sometimes in when you work with a an agency is you can end up working with people you just don't get on with yeah and now if i don't get on with someone i don't have to talk to them <laughs> it's yeah. great but luckily i do the guys are all great so i'm fortunate so far wicked well look i hope people do reach out to you and i wish you the best of luck and we'll uh we'll catch up with you in the future very very soon okay cheers sean thanks very much Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media, and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2,000 recruiters right now, both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level individual recruiters in your businesses how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn and would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week on LinkedIn. I'll see you soon.